Hello everyone, and thanks for attending to this presentation of our article, Learning Parity with Physical Noise. First, we need a bit of context. Uh, I guess most of you have heard about learning problems. They are getting more and more used in cryptography. So they are computationally hard problems that can be used to build cryptographic scheme. One of his most famous application is probably uh, post-quantum public key encryption schemes. Indeed, some of the most efficient lattice-based uh, schemes are relying on learning problems such as LWE, MLWE, LWR, etc. For instance, Kyber and Saber are both uh, NIST finalists and are both relying on, so on learning schemes. So NIST finalists in the post-quantum cryptography contest. Uh, there are also other uh, less famous but still useful cryptographic applications to learning schemes such as, such as homomorphic encryption, identity-based encryption, and many other cryptographic good things. Among all the learning problems, we will take a particular interest into the learning parity with parity noise problem, uh, which is probably the most straightforward, the most minimalist uh, learning problem. So. As in any learning problem, the idea is that an adversary is given public key vectors and noisy inner products between these public key vectors and the secret key. And it is computationally hard to retrieve the secret key. In the learning with parity noise case, the inner product occurs over F2. So we have a secret key which is an n-bit vector, public n-bit vectors, and the error added to the inner product is generated is a binary error, so generated according to a binary law with a known uh, error parameter. And given the public vectors and the noisy inner product, it is hard to retrieve k, the key. Uh, there exists a decision version of this problem, but it won't be useful to us in this article. We will only look into uh, the finding version. Uh, LPN seems minimalist and should be easy to implement. However, uh, when trust is gained in this uh, problem and we start to look into real implementation questions, there are many issues that are rising and mostly the error generation. Indeed, the error generation has to be cryptographically secure, uh, elsewise an adversary would just be able to remove the error and solve Uh, so, so system of equation which would just be a linear system of equation easy to solve. Uh, therefore, we need a cryptographically secure PRNG, which is time expensive, and this PRNG also proved to be a weak link in uh, side channel attacks against side channel attacks against implementation of schemes that rely on LPN. So, this is where the inexact computation steps in. In order to remove the PC's PRNG, uh, we can add the error directly when computing the inner product. If we use our processor in given condition, for instance, in our case, we used voltage overscaling and clock manipulation, so physical conditions, uh, we can get him to compute its operation with a controlled error. Um, By doing so, we will end up with the same results as by computing a correct inner product, then adding a generated error. Problem is, when doing so, uh, uh, we rely on a physical assumption rather than a theoretical one. It is not that much of an issue because at the end, when you are implementing a scheme, you always rely to some extent on a physical assumption that your implementation will be the same as your theoretical assumption. But there are some other issues that are raised by inexact computation, and this will be the first thing we'll talk about. So, first, in order to compute our physical inner product, there are two standard architectures that come to mind. First one is serial, the other one is parallel. Basically, they both start with a layer of AND gates, so you compute AND between the key bits and the public vector bits, then you have to XOR all of the ends output. You can either do it parallelly, 
uh, which means two by two, then you XOR the results and etc. So for instance, for a 32 bit physical in a product, you get five layers of XOR gates, or you can serially XOR them, which means XOR the two first, then add the third, add the fourth, etc. etc. So why should we consider different ways to compute this inner product? It's because, sadly, uh, we do not manage to control the error uh, so good that there are no dependencies. And there are mainly output dependencies, which means that the probability of error depends on the correct value of the inner product, which is not a property we want, since the correct value of the error product depends on the key, Uh, which means it will create unbalancedness in the results and it will, to some extent, leak some information. So we denote uh, epsilon 0 or epsilon 1, the probability of error knowing that the correct output of the inner product is 0 or 1. And we denote by delta the distance between those epsilons and their average. So basically, the bigger this delta is, the more output dependent the error is. So we want to mitigate it as much as possible. If we get, if we reach a, a delta of zero, uh, it will mean that there are, there are no output dependency. Uh, epsilon zero equals epsilon one, and uh, we are in the LPN case, which would be ideal. So now let me introduce a few other tweaks we can do to the architectures I just presented you in order to try to mitigate the delta. First, we can use a jittery clock. Basically, it means clock manipulation so that instead of the deterministic error we have, we also add jitter, which is random noise. Uh, that would be a good idea because it means that the error will come from both deterministic, so maybe without dependency causes, but also pure random one. Uh, we can also try to use power gating, which means connect uh, our circuit to the ground in order to lower the, the difference of tension needed to do the transition between 0 and 1 and 1 and 0 and try to balance it a little bit more. Uh, we can also try to use a serial architecture with bigger and more balanced gates. So we studied all these architectures and we ended up with the following simulated deltas. Basically, wh what we see is that the best way to mitigate delta is the KC, so with a jittery clock, mainly because of the probabilistic uh, cause of randomness that is not output dependent, so that mitigates uh, the output dependency effect in the total run, uh, error, probability of error. But what we can sadly also see is that even if we manage to reduce the delta, Uh, coming from the standard architectures, uh, we do not annihilate it, which means that there remains output dependency and the security of a scheme implemented with, uh, with a physical inner product cannot reduce directly to the security of LPN. This is what motivates the next section, which is a security reduction that proves that our physical inner product still rely on the security of LPN. So, in order to dive into our prediction, we first need to modelize our physical problem. In order to do a mathematical reduction, we need to properly define what we call the learning with parity noise with output dependency um, distribution. So it's still a learning problem. It relies on the same ideas than LPN. We have a K Uh, uh, n-bit secret key, two noises parameters, epsilon 0, epsilon 1, that are probabilities that remain inside 0 and 0.5. And as in LPN, we generate uniformly public key vectors uh, that are called x, compute their inner product with the secret key, and add an error. This time, the distribution that the error follows depends on the correct value of the inner product. This is why we have two noise parameters. Note that uh, this definition is more general than the LPN distribution. So it means that if we take epsilon 0 
equal to epsilon 1, we end up to we end up with uh, LPN distribution. And this observation allows us to make a double reduction with just one proof. Because what we did is build an algorithm that allowed us to transform a LPN OD samples into noisier ones. So what does it mean? It means that an adversary which has access to a LPN solver, for instance, can, with given LPN OD samples, use the algorithm to transform them into LPN samples, then use its solver. So it means that with some assumption on the noise parameters, LPN OD is at least as hard as LPN. So this is the, the side of the reduction that it interests us the most because uh, LPN is a known secured problem. So it gives confidence into our, our problem. But this algorithm also allows us to see the reduction the other way around because an adversary which has a LPN OD solver can this time take LPN samples, transform them into the LPN OD that, is, uh, that he can break using its solver. So uh, LPN is also at least as hard as LPN OD. So it says that this, both this problem seems to have the similar security, at least for the, the finding uh, version of these problems. So what are the ideas uh, that are hidden in this algorithm? Basically, so this algorithm takes a distribution as an input. It also takes uh, the, the parameters of this distribution and some uh, pa parameters that will be used inside the algorithm. And it outputs uh, a sample that follows another LPN OD distribution with noise parameter epsilon 0 prime, epsilon 1 prime. First, it checks that if the transformation is trying to do is possible. So for that, we have equations that are not detailed here because they are quite complex and not that useful. But basically, what it says is that you cannot transform any batch of samples into another one, which is pretty logical. I mean, if we're able to transform some LPN samples into noiseless ones, uh, it will be a pretty useful algorithm. Once we know the algorithm will be successful in its transformation, we first compute the last bit of the output sample. So we know that this sample will follow a LPN OD distribution with parameter epsilon 0 prime, epsilon 1 prime. Therefore, we know what will be the distribution of its last bit, and we can simulate it independently of the, the public vector that uh, will be put before it. Once we have it, we use the rejection sampling to generate the public key vector. So basically we use our input sampler that uh, just creates uh, some samples coming from the input distribution, add them some noise with the Bernoulli parameters our algorithm took uh, as inputs, and check if the last bit correspond with the one we generated earlier. If it does, we can just output the algorithm. If it does not, we keep doing it until it does. When you write the probability um, that the output of this algorithm uh, follows, you, you can show that it follows the right distribution. So we, we have an algorithm that takes a LPNOD distribution as an input and outputs another one. So this allowed us to have a concrete security estimation of LPNOD because what this uh, algorithm allows is to take some LPN samples following a noise parameter epsilon and transform them into LPNOD samples with noise parameter epsilon prime plus delta, epsilon prime minus delta, or the other way around, but it, it's the same for the formula, uh, with epsilon, epsilon prime and delta following the, the, the formula you see on the screen. So it means that with this parameter, LPN OD is at least as hard as LPN. And when we have uh, a scheme uh, that relies on LPN OD, we can have a security equivalent LPN wise. In this part of the presentation, we will introduce our FPGA prototype implementing a physical inner product. 
We have designed a full digital 512-bit LPPM processor targeting a Xilinx Spartan 6 LX75 FPGA mounted on a Sakura G board. No special purpose macros are required as PLLs or DCMs and only fabric elements from FPGA have been used. Our FPPM processor is composed by an inner product block, a variable delay line, a voltage sensor for fault tolerance and an error control mechanism that acts also as a finite state machine. Regarding the inner product, it is composed by a parallel XOR tree and a serial XOR tree. The inexact computing is achieved at capturing metastable state and glitching events on the output of the inner product block to generate errors. This allows us to remove the needs of a random number generator. We have designed a compact and full digital delay line composed by 16 carry 4 units. Carry 4 units are fast chains of XOR in SliceM and L used to implement arithmetic functions. Our delay line offers 64 taps providing 30 picoseconds per tap. Very compact 64 to 1 multiplexer has been implemented on LUTs and in slice F7 and F8 MOOCs in order to uh, choose the proper tap to generate the given probability of error. The error control module is implemented as a successive approximation register, SAR, to calibrate the LPPN at the startup. Seven batches of 1024 inner products are computed. At the end of each batch, the probability of error is computed and the control word CNTL that is applied to variable delay line is updated from the most significant bit to the least significant bit. After the calibration, the error probability is around 0.25. We have collected a huge amount of LPPN samples from our prototype. The delta has been found equal to 8.2%, indicating that this prototype suffers from non-negligible output dependency. To mitigate such dependency, we complemented the basic design with an additional dummy circuit in order to provide data-independent glitches. More specifically, we introduced those data independent glitches at the input and at the output of the serial XOR tree as shown in the slide. Adopting this solution, the normalized difference is reduced to 5.8%. The LPN OD as defined before is at least as hard as the LPN with parameter n and epsilon with the key secret key k, where epsilon is epsilon prime minus delta over 1 minus 2 times delta. Concretely, for the delta equal to 8.2%, around an error probability of 0.25 reached in the FPGA prototype, we have an LPN OD with those given parameters, which security reduces to a, an LPN with parameter n equal to 512 and epsilon 0.20. Using the best known attack against LPN, this gives us at least 80 bits of security for a scheme which would rely on our implementation. We now move to other results. Masking helps against differential power analysis and structured error, but also mitigates delta. Indeed, an adversary does not have access to Z, which is the physical inner product computed on one of the share of the key, but only its leakage L, which gives a probability of observing Z equal to I, given the leakage L, that is equal to 1 over 2 plus a parameter delta that is in the range of 0, 1 over 2. The only imbalance that an adversary cannot serve will therefore give us an epsilon 0 prime and an epsilon 1 prime defined as shown on the slide. If delta is 1 over 2, then the recovery of z is perfect so that we have that epsilon 0 prime is equal to epsilon 0 and epsilon 1 prime is equal to epsilon 1. If delta is equal to 0, then there is no leakage so that we have that epsilon 0 prime is equal to epsilon 1 prime, that is, in turn, equal to epsilon. So that the latter shows that in case an implementation is masked and then the adversary does not exploit the leakage, then exploiting the output data dependency with a filtering attack is not possible. We collected 4 million power consumption traces to estimate Mangar's signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR. ISSNR values have been found on the first stage, that means the end layer, where the dependency on the circuit is still quite high. Yet, 
highest peak of SNR are in the order of 10 to the minus 5, which means that bullion masking can be considered as an interesting candidate for countermeasures that can efficiently leverage on key homomorphic features of the LPPN. We ported the basic LPPN design to a more recent and actual platform, the Xilinx Arctic 7-100T, which is a 28 nanometer technology FPGA, mounted on a new AE CW305 board. For this implementation we have found a delta of 1.5% that is strongly reduced compared to the Spartan 6 design. Such reduction confirms the technological dependency of this aspect. To conclude, now we summarize the pros and cons of the inexact computing applied to LPN and its FPGA prototype. So as pros, we can consider good performances and good features for SCA protection. As cons, we have to consider that the LPPN relies on physical assumptions and induces data-dependent error. Security reduction handles the data-dependent errors, which are themselves being reduced by smart hardware implementation. As next step, we will investigate other learning problems, such as the learning with errors, in order to build even more advanced primitives. Thanks for your attention.